I begin this session with a question that I've been dying to ask you. Why watch by? Namaskaram to Calicut. It's lovely to be here. This is a wonderful fest. I love coming here. Thank you for coming for the session. Thank you to Meena. Uh, the uh, reason to do Atal Bihari Vajpayee was because uh, I have embarked on writing a trilogy of three Prime Ministers. Uh, the first one was Indira Gandhi, uh, which came out in 2017. And the second one is Atal Bihari Vajpayee. And there's a third Prime Minister I'm working on. Who that is, I can't tell you. But uh, the Vajpayee is, uh, we decided to do Vajpayee because at the moment, we have a BJP Prime Minister. But we tend to forget that before Mr. Narendra Modi, there was Mr. Atal Bihari Vajpayee. And Mr. Atal Bihari Vajpayee was rather a different kind of a politician. He was a constitutional democrat. He was a parliamentarian for 50 years. Not for 10 years, not for 20 years, not for 30 years, Meena, not for 40 years, but for 50 years, he was a parliamentarian. Uh, he was steeped in parliament. Uh, today, when we see parliament, uh, in a way, uh, marginalized, uh, we see parliament uh, made less important than it should be. There was a time when there was a prime minister who located himself squarely within parliament. Uh, so it was in many ways to draw out the contrasts of today, as well as the similarities of today uh, with Mr. Atal Bihari Vajpayee and the regime today that we decided to do Vajpayee. What was very fascinating for me, it's a wonderful book, I must tell that to the audience, it's an absolutely wonderful book. And you treated the subject with a lot of empathy, which I, I really appreciate you for that. You you. Know? The kind of empathy you treated the subject with, but you have been, it's a critical biography. So the question that, again, uh, I wanted to raise was, consciously or unconsciously, there is a binary that runs throughout the book between yes. Vajpayeeism and Moditva. And when I say that, it is not just about political ideology, it, it, is, it is much deeper and much more complex than that. It is about human traits, it is about individuals, it's about subjectivity, it's about respect, it's about a lot of things, not just about political ideology. Would you care to talk about that? Yes, uh, that's very well put. Uh, there is a binary that runs throughout the book. But, you know, before we get into the ideology, as you rightly pointed out, I'll speak a little bit about the person that Vajpayee was. Because if we look at the personality, we can also see the comparisons and contrasts with today. Now, Vajpayee, as we know, in his personal life, was almost a bohemian. You know, does everybody here, uh, would everybody here follow a phrase in Hindi? Would you understand one phrase in Hindi? For example, Vajpayee used to say, Main kuwara hu brahmachari nahi. You know that I am a bachelor, but I am not a celibate. And I think for a prime minister to say that, uh, you know, reflects a kind of an unconventional uh, personality that Vajpayee was. You know, he lived all his life with the woman that he loved, Mrs. Call. He was never married to her, but he lived with her and her husband uh, in the same house for years. And at a press conference once, a journalist actually asked Mr. Vajpayee, when he was foreign minister in 1978, that Mr. Vajpayee, forget about Pakistan and Tibet and China, tell us, yeah, who is Mrs. Call? Who is this Mrs. Call in your life? And Vajpayee thought for a while and said, the situation is like Kashmir. So, you know, Kashmir is a mamla hai. So, he was able to make fun of his own life. Uh, he was a highly self-deprecating individual. I was a journalist in Outlook magazine when I used to cover Vajpayee. 
and Vajpai used to have these holy parties in his house. You know, we used to have holy milans and there would be dholaks and there would be uh, manjiras and Yashwan Sinha would be dancing away. And every time I went to the uh, holy milan to meet Vajpai, he would look at me and say, ah, khatra, khatra, you know, danger, danger. So, you know, that was the kind of a funny personality that he was. Underneath the fun and the, uh, and the uh, uh, light-heartedness, there was a line that Vajpai was trying to create of a middle ground between Hindu nationalism and constitutional democracy. You know, he did try to do that. And I think his life was a kind of tightrope walk between these uh, two polarities. And he used to make fun of his own party men, you know. Uh, for example, in those days, the RSS was very rigid about vegetarianism. And Vajpayee was a confirmed non-vegetarian. He loved his chicken and he loved his prawn and he loved his uh, glass of whiskey and, you know, all of that. And uh, he used to make fun of his own party men because at a dinner, uh, one of his party colleagues once said that Deen Dayal Upadhyay has come to me in a dream and has told me never eat chicken. And Vajpai turned around and said, Are, such a big person comes in your dream and all he says is don't eat chicken. You know, so that was the kind of uh, uh, mocking that he used to do of his own party, which seemed very, um, very uh, light-hearted and very comic, but served to create a personality for himself, which was singular, which was the so-called good man in the bad party, which was the so-called misfit, the bohemian, the unconventional figure in the puritanical Sangh Parivar, the uh, colorful uh, sort of bon vivant in, a, in the khaki brotherhood. And it was a personality and a persona which he cultivated, you know, which he cultivated and which he projected and which he used as his USP. He was not popular in his party for many reasons. And he, as I said, he, he would often joke about the fact that he was a misfit within the Sangh Parivar. He would, you know, in 1989, when Vajpayee was diagnosed with, a, uh, with an illness, he was in uh, America. And at that time, Vajpayee, as you know, used to write poetry. And he wrote a poem at that point when he was diagnosed with a very severe illness called Maud Se Thangai, I Am Confronting Death. And uh, the poem came back to India and all the party men, all the people in the sun said, Oh God, Vajpayee has written about death, you know, is he, is he dying? Uh, what's happening? Is Vajpayee, you know, dying? Is he, is he at death's door? It turned out that he was cured from that and he returned to India safe and sound. When he came back to India, large numbers of party men came to the airport to meet him. And uh, one of his aides turned around and said, look, Vajpayee ji, so many people have come to see you. So many people have come to meet you at the airport. So Vajpayee said, ye soch rahe hai, you know, how has he come back alive when he has written a song, when he has written a poem about death? So, uh, you know, I think these were the ways that he steered this independent course. And the reason why I'm bringing these sort of light-hearted examples in is because they were very fundamental to Vajpayee. You know, he, he used them uh, to create a as I said, to create a persona for himself and also to nudge his party uh, in a slightly different direction. To say that, yes, I am the leader of, I am your leader, but I'm not like you. I don't buy into the orthodoxies and the conventions that you do. Uh, so in that sense, he was, a, he was an eccentric, he was singular, but as we will come to later in the, in the discussion, he was also, uh, I would say, weak and fallible. I think in a city like Calicut, bus bursting with all kinds of non-vegetarian yes. flavors, to think of something like a food ban 
you know yes, so would food be ban would be, yeah. be unthinkable so, for vajpai yeah so that's something that makes vajpai in a sense beloved yes. to many malayalis yes that, you know. and you know in fact he was in america and beef was being served at, at the table and uh, his party men said vajpai oh my god you are sitting at the table where beef is being served and vajpai tells him are that was an american cow Not an Indian, not, not an, an Indian cow. cow. So I mean, you know, he he was um, in that sense, uh, you know, he was a confirmed, as he said, I am a cutter non-vegetarian. You know, so he was one of those people who loved his food. Um, he loved his uh, his drink, uh, and uh, and and that persona, in a way, was also political. You know, as we know, as feminists. the personal is the political and i think the personal in vajpai was certainly also the political yes to but to come back to a more serious yes. uh, note uh, you know the hindutva agenda that he in a sense consecrated in the parliament yeah. uh, i think he did that to a large extent in the five decades that we are talking about but i think he also worshiped a different deity as you pointed out yes. so that must have created a lot of tension a lot of ambivalence uh, you know the tight rope walking that you're talking about so how do you think this biographical subject was able to handle that kind of tension and maybe project a different kind of a facade yeah outside? you know uh when we are writing biographies and and i'm sure you'll bear me out on this is we aim to uh perhaps not to agree with but at least to empathize and to understand you know and in the context in which vajpai lived remember he started his uh, personal his political journey in 1957 now this was the years of the decade of nehruvian dominance i mean the congress was getting plus 300 seats in every election 1952 election over 300 seats 1957 election over 300 seats 1962 election over 300 seats 1967 election okay the congress came down but still won 1971 indira gandhi 365 seats so the dominance of the congress was so uh, suffocating it was so uh, in a way burdensome that here was someone who was in the opposition he was an opposition politician all his life you know in fact today i say that the government goes by the term opposition mukt bharat let's get rid of the opposition but where would vajpai be if there was an opposition mukt bharat he was a opposition politician all his life and nehruvian parliamentary democracy made it possible for vajpai's voice to be heard so nehruvian parliamentary democracy made possible the emergence of nehru's greatest enemy uh, which is why he revered parliament and parliament was the place where the opposition is heard you know the the, uh, the house the lok sabha is the opposition's house it's where the opposition lives because the opposition in a parliamentary democracy has no executive power uh we have the opposition has no uh, government power the opposition exists in the lok sabha and that is where it takes the government on and that is where vajpai took the government on now when we say hindutva yes he was vajpai was a hindu nationalist uh he was an rss man all his life now in government he was not an rss man in government he was not a hindu nationalist he became a nehruvian but he used hindu nationalism and he used the hindu nationalist movement to catapult himself to power and when we ask ourselves why did vajpai never break with hindu nationalism or why did he not break with the rss it's because he was a believer you know he was a believer and this was a challenge for me because i'm a i'm a die hard liberal and i've written a book why i'm a liberal so for me to uh, appreciate vajpai's ideology uh, was a challenge i had to work at it you know um, i had to find out so you know i had to 
I had to, in that sense, work at understanding an ideology uh, which is very different from mine. But again, you know, when we're writing biographies, we locate the character in context, and we also have to appreciate how the character evolves over time, because we change over time. All of us change over time. You know, Vajpayee came from a family which was socialist. His father was a socialist. Uh, his father was the inspector of schools in the Gwalior states, which was a loyalist uh, to the British Raj. And his father was deadly opposed to the RSS. In fact, uh, uh, am I being censored? Yeah, and uh, in fact, uh, uh, in fact, you know, when Vajpayee joined the RSS, his father was very much opposed to it. And there's this uh, uh, story by which Vajpayee's sister used to throw his shorts over the back wall. So Vajpayee used to run around with the black wall and pick up his shorts and then go for his RSS shaka. So, uh, you know, and, 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 and I had to ask myself, and I had, and I had to ask myself the question as to uh, what drew Vajpayee to the RSS. And I think in the beginning, what drew him to the RSS was that he just adored center stage. You know, he was a great speaker. He was a great orator. And it was in the RSS that he uh, was recognized and seen as the kind of orator and the kind of speaker that he was. And you know, in those days, again, the biographer seeks context. You know, the biographer has to look at context. What was life like in the 1920s and 1930s in Madhya Bharat? You know, home is boring. Home is ordinary. Home is stultifying. Home it is still is. full of the reverence. <laughs> yes, full of the reverential hierarchical structures of middle class India. But you go into a shaka, an RSS shaka, and suddenly you're in an egalitarian space. Uh, you're in a kind of a sort of male bonding space, which attracts you. And that attracted him and he wrote about it. Uh, so again, the biographer seeking context uh, has to appreciate that that was this 14-year-old uh, in the 1920s and 1930s joining the RSS. But the RSS molded him, Golwalkar, uh, Deen Dayal Upadhyay, Bala Sahib Deoras, they molded him and projected him, and so which is why he was loyal to them all his life. But I would say that in, in, in the sense of his own personal ideology and his own personal uh, stance, he changed massively over time. You know, again, the biographer uh, has to recognize that people change and people are complicated. You know, Indira Gandhi is a very complicated person. When I, when I, uh, when I, uh, uh, started writing my biography of Indira Gandhi. I just draw a small parallel here. I always thought that Indira Gandhi and Jawaharlal Nehru, her father, were very, very close. It was a very close bond. But there were a lot of tensions in that relationship. And uh, she was quite angry at her father a lot of the time. And uh, in the same way with Vajpayee, you know, when you delve deep into a person, you find that they are not the newspaper headline. They are not the newspaper photograph. Actually, there's someone completely different. Uh, they have gone through a path um, that uh, we can only try to imagine and we can only try and understand. I was reminded of Walt Whitman. Yeah. I contradict myself. What if I contradict myself? Yes. I think we, you know, as Immanuel Kant said, uh, out of the crooked timber of humanity, nothing straight comes. Are we all straight people? Are we all straight lines and straight trajectories and straight moves? Or are we crooked? Crooked in the sense of, crooked in terms of humanity. Is our humanity, is, as human beings, are we uh, changeable and uh, uh, complicated? You know, and, and in that sense, uh, I, think, I think that's what I learned from Vajpayee. But, you know, I also learned from Vajpayee, and as a liberal, I learned this lesson, that you can have love, you can have friendship, you can have comradeship 
even if you don't have a hundred percent agreement. And you know, this was the, the lesson of the parliamentarians of the 1940s and 50s. Bajpai was very close to the left, he was close to the socialists, he was close to the Congress. He had friends everywhere, he may not have agreed with them. Today, you know, we are unfriending people on Facebook and we are unfriending people on Twitter and we are having wars with people on social media. But there was a time when you could disagree and still remain friends. You could disagree and still remain parliamentary colleagues. You could disagree and still remain uh, close uh, associates. Uh, so that was a, a, another lesson for me uh, on not just the freedom of speech, but the freedom to listen. And the freedom of friendship. And which... the freedom of friendship. And the freedom to, that the freedom of speech actually is also about the freedom to listen. Uh, you know, if we, we, we can speak, all too often we think that we, we just need to speak. But we need to speak, but because we need to speak, we also need to listen. And Vajpai was a great listener. Yeah. But in spite of all this, in the book, Sagarika calls Vajpai uh, an ultimate political careerist which I thought was a little unfair because in retrospect, his political careerism pales in comparison to much of what we are seeing today. Oh yes, oh yes. I mean, remember in Vajpayee's time in 1999, a government fell by one vote. Yeah. Uh, if you remember when Jai Lalita uh, withdrew support and the government fell and then it, it fell by that one vote in 1999. Uh, Im can you we imagine a time today that a government will fall by one vote? I mean, that vote would be, you know, <laughs> bought and sold a hundred times. Uh, Vajpayee's close associate was um, uh, George Fernandez, the socialist, was Brajesh Mishra, who was not an RSS background, was Jaswan Singh, who is, uh, again, not an RSS background. But I'll tell you why I called him a careerist is because, you know, Vajpayee was the ultimate uh, politician. He was, he had, he had the lust for power. He wanted who, to be who, Prime Minister. Who doesn't? Who doesn't? So did Indira Gandhi. Uh, Vajpayee wanted center stage. He wanted to be at the center of uh, India. And, he, you know, when Rajiv Gandhi became uh, Prime Minister after Indira Gandhi's assassination, he said to his friend that, you know, why have they made Rajiv Gandhi Prime Minister? They should make me Prime Minister. I have more experience. So, you know, he wanted to be Prime Minister. He was, he was extremely ambitious and very tenacious. You know, he hung on and he hung on and he hung on. In, after 1984, when the BJP was uh, annihilated, was defeated, got two seats. Vajpayee himself was defeated from Gwalior. Uh, and Advani replaced Vajpayee as uh, party president and Vajpayee never again became BJP party president. But he would still every day go to the party office, every day he would go and meet people, every day he would uh, go and make sure that his face was there. He was tenacious and Nina Vyas, the veteran journalist, once asked him that Vajpayee, you are now completely on the margins. You are a marginalized figure now. Why are you keeping on coming to the party office? You are so marginalized. Nobody cares about you anymore. And so Vajpayee thought for a long time and said, Nina ji, sometimes to make corrections, you need the margin. You know, so you need the margin to make corrections. So I, you know, in that sense, he was unwilling to let go. You know, he was tenacious. He didn't agree with the uh, Ram Janmabhoomi movement. He didn't agree with Advani's Rath Yatra. He thought it was not Tanki. He thought it was drama. Uh, he thought it was not the kind of uh, movement that he was comfortable with because he was never a street activist. Natak, that's what but he But he called. went along with it. He went along with it because he wanted power. 
You know, I mean, the thing is, that's the inescapable conclusion that the biographer again has to come to. That why is this guy doing this? You know, he, I can understand him. He's, he's, um, you know, he, he seems a poet. He's got finer things in life. He has a bohemian relationship. He's, uh, uh, you know, he's courageous about his personal morality. Uh, he doesn't care about middle class morality. He's living with a woman he loves and he, he's not marrying her. So why is he, why is he uh, making common cause with this movement? Because he had the lust for power. <laughs> you know, he, was, he wanted to be, uh, he wanted to, to seize the throne of Delhi. Actually, Sagarika, I don't know whether you know this. The mimicry artists in Kerala thrived on watch by, you know. Really? Uh, they, yeah, they, were, yeah. they were fascinated. So many programs where yeah, watch yeah, by yeah. was a subject. Yeah. In fact, you know, when watch by came to Kerala, he came to Kumarakom and he wrote uh, essays on the beauty of Kerala and Kumarakom. And his Kumarakom essays uh, were essays where he actually, for the first time, made a, a big reach out to Pakistan because he said he wanted to uh, have talks with Pakistan on Kashmir and also said that, uh, uh, you know, also wanted a judicial settlement on the Ram Janmabhoomi issue. And after that, when he went back on all of this, people asked him, but in your Kumarakom musings, you had written that you wanted a judicial solution to the Ram Janmabhoomi movement, you reached out to Pakistan. So then he said, yes, I was very much moved by the beauty of Kerala. So, uh, he, he loved Kerala and he loved Kumarakam. Yeah. You speak about the moral frailty of yeah. Vajpayee. But, you know, as I was reading deeper into what you have written, I felt that this moral frailty was something that he wore on his sleeve. You know, it was a ploy, it was a strategy, almost a political strategy of sorts. Would you agree with me there? That's very insightful, Meena. That's exactly what he did. He used uh, his so-called good man image. You know, the hand wringing, lamenting, oh, this Ram Janmabhoomi movement, I don't like it, it's too bad. Why are we doing this? This is not something. But you know, uh, he used it and he, um, and he uh, used it to come to power. And you know, Advani actually, and this was told to me by a close friend of uh, Mr. Advani, he resented Vajpayee because Vajpayee very cleverly made himself out to be uh, the gentle liberal and Advani was made into the uh, hardcore demagogue, the sort of uh, hardliner, the sort of, you know, the extremist and Vajpayee was a so-called moderate. But it was just a clever piece of, it was a clever piece of acting. It was, uh, it was shadow, it was just a game. Both Vajpayee and Advani saw the potential of the Ram Janmabhoomi movement to gain power. Both Advani and Vajpayee were equally liberal and equally hardline actually, I would say. Vajpayee made some very hardline speeches. But Vajpayee very cleverly, very politically uh, and in a very chameleon-like way was able to manipulate his image in a way that Advani could never do. Advani was what you see is what you get. You know, I am the fire-breathing Hindutva demagogue. Vajpayee could also play that fire-breathing demagogue, but he was very careful about his image. Yeah. And he was very careful about projecting the sort of uh, liberal, moderate image. So he had a chameleon-like quality, which Advani didn't have. I think, but for the Janasangh and yes. the earlier generation of BJP, Vajpayee yes. was almost a mascot, yes. right? Uh, but then when you come to the electoral ballot uh, uh, box, I think in, from two seats in 1984 to yes. 182 in 1998, yes. much of that was the, 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 the master brain of Advani, yes. LK Advani. So you've looked at it, but I would love you to share this uh, with the audience, uh, this very peculiar dynamics between Advani and Vajpayee, yes. which I thought was fascinating, you know, fascinating weakness. It is a very fascinating relationship and you know, in all long relationships, I think they're shot through with love, hate, jealousy, envy, affection, mutual respect. Uh, you know, there's so many different shades in long relationships, you know, competitiveness. And I think it was the same thing with Vajpayee and Advani. Vajpayee started out as the star of the Janasang. 
you know, and he was the protege of Shama Prasad Mukherjee. He was Shama Prasad Mukherjee's golden boy. Advani was always at the back. But then in 1984, after the defeat of 1984 and the assassination of Indira Gandhi, which is, Advani called that election not a Lok Sabha election, but a Shok Sabha election because it was, you know, the Congress got 400 seats and the BJP was wiped out. That's when Advani started coming to the fore and Vajpayee took a back seat. And he didn't like that. He just did not like that because he wanted to be the star. He wanted to be the, the main man and he always was the main man. He was always the on, the, the on stage performer. Advani was always at the back. So, you know, in any relationship, uh, there's always the star and there's the follower. Right? There's, a, there's someone who is the glamour person and someone who is the less glamorous. And I think that was the dynamic between the two of them. So when Advani started to eclipse uh, the star, you know, Vajpayee, the golden boy of Golwalkar, he didn't like it and it, there was a lot of tension at that stage. But Vajpayee was never a party builder. You know, he didn't remember names of people. He used to call Govindacharya Dronacharya. You know, because he had no idea about Govindacharya's name. He said, he Dronacharya ko bulalo. And, you know, and, uh, uh, but Advani was very different. He knew the nuts and bolts of, uh, of the party and he built the organization. But, you know, it's interesting that it was actually Advani, L.K. Advani, who in 1995 decided that the prime ministerial candidate of the BJP should be Vajpayee and not himself. So in that sense, Advani, you know, this is the other inescapable conclusion that I came to, that Advani, in a sense, was perhaps more dedicated to the BJP than Vajpayee. You know, Vajpayee believed in himself. He Ad believed in, in, in his own personality, in his own personality cult. But Advani actually built the party. And that personality and cult was also, there was a certain kind of a flippancy. And a flippancy. Which I think, yeah. And, and, you know, a kind of a uh, sort of a jokey exterior yeah. that he had, which he, which was very popular. But uh, he was not bothered with the, you know, with the nitty gritty of party organization. But Advani did more for the BJP than Vajpayee. Vajpayee was never a um, hard working party man. You know, he was the on stage star. So when Advani named Vajpayee as the prime ministerial candidate, the reason why he did that was because, you know, those were coalition times. You had to attract different allies, you had to attract the communists, you had to attract the, Congre uh, the, the, the regional parties. And Advani knew that his own image was too hardline, he was too much of a demagogue. He, in a way, you know, in a way, Advani comes across to me uh, as a very sort of a, it's a, it's a tragedy actually what happened to Advani. Because he tried to build the party, but in the end became uh, completely associated with a hardline demagogue, uh, you know, uh, malevolent image. Vajpayee was doing the same thing, but didn't get the image. But Advani in a sense sacrificed himself you know, to build the party. And then when in 1995, when, uh, when it came to deciding on the prime ministerial uh, candidate, he gave it to Vajpayee. So he made himself the, the bad guy. You know, I'm the bad guy. I'm the, uh, I'm the hawk. I'm the Hindutva hardliner. I'm the one you can abuse. But he's the nice guy, vote for him. He's the good guy. So in that sense, you know, he performed this act of, uh, he could have said that I'm also a liberal, I'm also a, you know, I also believe in constitutional democracy, which he did actually in a way. But uh, he very much uh, played that aspect of him down, made himself the bad guy. Would you and, say and, that? And uh, voiced you, uh, yeah. the, the kind of uh, sentiments that, that, that uh, he knew were galvanizing the Hindutva cadres and let Vajpayee be the sort of hand-wringing, lamenting, liberal hero. <laughs> Would you say that that was carefully choreographed by the party maybe? Yes. In fact, I write in the book that, you know, Advani was very upset 
that he was called a hardliner and Vajpayee was called a liberal. And he said, but that's not true. I am also a liberal. I'm just saying all this just to build my party. Uh, and I'm also doing the, I'm doing the Hindutva movement. Vajpayee is also doing the Hindutva movement. What's the difference? The party said, no, you be the bad guy. He'll be the good guy, good cop, bad cop. And that way we'll have a binary between the two and that's how we will uh, manage the dynamics. So this sort of law purush, vikas purush, you know, the iron man, development man was a kind of a binary that, uh, that was very much created as a sort of a device, as a tactical device uh, to, uh, to win elections and also to feed to the media. You know, it became a very neat media categorization. Uh, and it became a very neat personality study. And Vajpayee very much played to it. And then Vajpayee wrote, you know, in uh, Advani's uh, autobiography, if you see Vajpayee's foreword, he writes in that, that, you know, unfortunately, Mr. Advani has been painted as a hawk and I've been painted as a liberal, whereas in fact, uh, you know, that's not the case. It's not actually accurate. And, uh, but, uh, uh, but it, so in that sense, uh, you know, they were both aware of it, but they played the game as strategy and as a tactic. See, the constitutional respectability yes. of, of Vajpayee, yes. it was severely morally compromised, as yes. you point out. But uh, I was also thinking, what, the, what was your method, uh, you know, in unearthing this moral compromises? Uh, what was the biographer's method? You know, uh, I'll tell you something that, uh, that, uh, that is a secret. I write and I research uh, at night, at dawn. You know, and if anybody wants to start writing and you want to start the writing process, I would say wake up early, wake up at about 3.30 in the morning and get to your desk when it's just about getting light because then, you know, the mind is very fresh and you all, almost feel as if the ghost of the person is hovering over your head and you know you kind of uh, you can kind of sense what they were thinking I think what the biographer looks for when you look for moral frailty or when you look for moral compromises is uh, you look at what the person is saying and what they're actually doing you know you can say uh, that I believe in this you can make speeches about what you believe in but when you're when your, your actions are something very different, uh, then you realize that the person is, is hedging, is playing a trade-off. You know, it's very interesting that during the Rath Yatra uh, of Advani, uh, Lalu Prasad Yadav and Mulayam Singh Yadav, who were chief ministers of Bihar and Uttar Pradesh, came to Vajpayee and said, you know, Mr. Vajpayee, you need to stop this Rath Yatra because wherever Mr. Advani is going, there are crowds and there are communal riots and there are people on the streets and they're causing violence and you need to, you know, you re need to stop this. And uh, Vajpayee said, ha, 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 this has to be stopped. We have to stop all these communal riots and we can't have all this. So he called Advani and he said, you know, Advani ji, they're saying that, you know, you're causing communal riots and you're causing Hindu-Muslim tension. We have to stop. And Advani said, what do you mean we have to stop? We're getting huge crowds. Huge crowds are coming to see us. So why should we stop? And Vajpayee says, Acha, huge crowds are coming. Okay, then that's fine. You know, so if, if crowds were coming, that became its own morality. So the ability to infuse morality where your own interests are being met was again a very sort of tactical uh, ploy that he used repeatedly to sort of moralize the, the so-called mission, that this is a people's movement that this is a movement from below, that this is a movement for the authentic uh, voice of Indians, uh, this is the authentic cry for, of, of, of the Hindu, of the sort of suppressed Hindu. He may not have believed in any of this. You know, because, because if you look at his speeches in Parliament, he, there he's quoting Churchill and he's quoting Toynbee and he's quoting, uh, uh, you know, Western scholars on pluralism. So on the one hand, you know, you're looking at all these speeches on pluralism and, uh, and secular values. And then on the other hand, you know, he's playing this other game. So uh, clearly, this is someone who is 
uh, who is, as I said, not just a careerist, but who's also trying to constantly uh, justify himself, justify his own actions and moralize his own actions through sort of theoretical slates and theoretical uh, formulations that he knows are, um, that he knows are, uh, are, are uh, faulty, but he's still, he's still doing them, you know. So in that sense, I think that's why I think he wrote poetry. You know, I think he wrote poetry because it was a sort of ambiguous, uh, fuzzy wuzzy arena which he could inhabit, in which everything was explained and everything was justified through the power of words and through the how he could use words and how he could make one word come after the other word and that would make sense. So, you know, uh, a poem makes sense because you place the words in a certain way and that in itself is self-justifying because it makes that in itself is a sensible thing. But, uh, so, you know, in that sense, he poured out his heart in, in, in various poems. But again, in poems, you find that, you know, his, he's playing a double game. Because there's one poem he, where he will write about how can you uh, rise to power on the basis of corpses? And, you know, should you kill people to rise to power? Should you murder innocents to rise to power? He's writing that. On the other hand, he's saying, you know, it's lonely at the top and I want to be at the top. And at the top, I feel the sort of clear airs of the Himalayas. So there are lots of self-justifying um, uh, sort of uh, poems that he has. But I think, you know, at the end of the day, I had to wrestle with uh, why is Vajpayee important? You know, why is, what you asked me in the beginning. Why is Vajpayee important? Why is he worth a biography? I think Vajpayee is important because he tries to locate Hindu nationalism and uh, Hindu uh, ideas within constitutional democracy and within parliament. You know, he wanted to make Hindu nationalism into a rational, reasonable force expressed within parliament. Not to make it a street fighting uh, demagoguery of um, uh, activists on the street. Vajpayee was never a street fighting politician. But I think the reason why he's important is because he constantly tried to voice uh, right wing Indian views. And he believed that the Hindu nationalist right wing viewpoint had a right to exist had a right to exist in India, but it only had a right to exist if it was expressed within the norms and rules of parliament. And I think that's what's important. You know, what he said is, Mariyada mein rehkar, simao ke bhitar. You know, stick to your honor, stay within the limits. Stay within the limits of parliamentary democracy stay within the limits of democracy. Because democracy is about rules, norms, procedures. It's not just about anarchism and uh, do what you want and freedom. And, you know, it's, not, it's about respecting the institutions. You know, today we have disrespect for institutions. We have a personality cult which is, uh, you know, riding roughshod over the party system. Vajpayee was not about all of that. Vajpayee was about parliamentary process, democratic process, constitutional process, the processes and institutions and norms and rules of parliamentary democracy. That is where Hindu nationalism can be expressed. That's why I think Vajpayee is valuable. Sagrika, I completely agree with what you said right now. But I was also thinking when Vajpayee tried to bring in Hindu nationalism as a point of view in the parliament, it seemed a completely legitimate kind of a desire. But the ominousness of that desire yes. comes up in the subsequent decades, you know, which went far beyond anything that Vajpayee did ever think about, I think. So, so I the think question, that's a, that's a yeah. very important yeah. uh, 
pointer that, yeah. you've, that yeah. you've indicated. Yeah. So the, the question is, you know, in spite of all that he stood for, the people of India seem to show him that it's not moderates we want, we love our dictators, yes. right? So what brought about this transition? What is this des desire for dictatorship? How do you see that as a journalist? Well, I think that's a very, very important question and I'll just, I'll tackle it in two parts. I'll first talk about what Vajpayee did and what he was unable to see. You know, when Vajpayee was in government, uh, when he came to power in 1999 with full majority, with, not with full majority, but with a functioning coalition, he was attacked constantly by the RSS. It was the RSS, the Swadeshi Jagran Manch, and the uh, Bharatiya, uh, the, 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 the Bharatiya Jagran Manch, who were attacking him constantly. You know, they were the Swadeshi stormtroopers who felt that Vajpayee was too moderate, too globalizing, too much into economic reform. He was not pushing the uh, Ayodhya movement. He was, you know, he was freeing up the telecom sector, freeing up the insurance sector. In fact, Ashok Singhal of the VHP and K.S. Sudarshan of the RSS and Dattupant Hengadi uh, of the Bharatiya Mazdoor Sangh, they were the three people who were constantly attacking Vajpayee, constantly attacking Vajpayee. So Vajpayee in government tried to keep these hotheads at bay, but he failed. You know, I would say if Vajpayee had won in 2004, if Vajpayee had won the election in 2004, I think we would have had a very different BJP today. Because the fact that he was unable to win, I think, uh, I think has, uh, has made the party go in a certain direction because the Vajpayee line, the moderate, centrist, secular, uh, reformist line got discredited. It was felt that this, would, this could never win elections. Why do we go for dictators today? I think a lot of it has to do with the media. You know, today the media is pushing personalities all the time. We have cult of personality coming at you from the screen. We have cult of personality coming at you from social media. You have cult of personality on Instagram, on Twitter, on Facebook. It's face, face, face all the time. Uh, so I think in, in, in this media saturated universe, what I call the media 360, 24 by 7 universe, this universe is uniquely vulnerable to personality, you know, to, to faces and to people and to the individual. So I think in this sense, um, everywhere you look, you have personality cults in, uh, not just in politics, you have it in Bollywood, you have it in society, you have it in the industrial sector. So I think the media, in a sense, is creating a personality cult. I think the personality cult is also being created because, uh, you know, we are all, in a sense, looking for uh, the Superman. You know, the, 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 uh, there is a sort of impatience with slowness. You know, I'm a votary of slow journalism. I'm an old-fashioned person and I believe in slow journalism. In my time, journalism was slow. You know, you wrote your copy, you gave it to the copy editor, the copy editor looked at it, gave it to the news desk, the news desk looked at it, and then finally it was vetted three or four times, it made it to the page. Today, you have fast, fast, fast journalism. Everything is quick, you upload it on your phone, it's gone, it's viral, it's immediately a clickbait or viral tweet or whatever. So we want quick solutions to things. You know, in a democracy, speed uh, sometimes leads to authoritarianism. If you want to cut through the clutter, you know, quickly fix this and quickly fix that. Demonetization, demonetize all notes at, uh, you know, eight o'clock at uh, eight, eight o'clock in the night. Lockdown in 24 hours. You know, these quick sort of decisions are seen as decisive governance, but they are authoritarian, they're anti-democratic, and they are ultimately uh, about creating a personality cult. So we want, you know, we're looking for saviors. 
we're looking for heroes we're looking for superman and batman and spider-man superman will come and sort everything out and the messiah will come riding the white horse and sort our problems out that's fantasy that's not real uh real reality is slow incremental change through democratic process that is what safeguards the individual that is what safeguards individual liberty and safeguards our liberty if we put our faith in speed or in a messiah or in a strong man or in someone who's going to come charging on a white horse and sort everything out then we are asking for authoritarianism we're asking for an elected autocrat we are asking for someone uh who is going to dominate over us you know it was said that in the 1930s the enemy of democracy was fascism uh, was communism in the 1940s the enemy of democracy was fascism today the enemy of democracy is democracy because leaders are coming through the democratic process and then turning their back on democracy and turning their back on the democratic processes and becoming elected authoritarians uh, so the elected authoritarians are all over the world now so there's a rash of elected authoritarianism and i think that when we uh, when we vote for elected authoritarians we should ask ourselves the question am i looking for a democratic solution or am i looking for a savior because if you're looking for a savior you're looking for a dictator yes i think with that we open up the session to the audience uh, if there are pressing questions please do raise them well at the outset i thank you and i can't express expressing my immense gratitude to you because uh, as a better biography writer you were very truly uh, what i'm to say the whole aspects of what budget uh, was that was really a revealing a thing for the audiences like me for that i give you all the credit that you have done a very wonderful job but uh, there are certain things of which uh, i have to disagree with you that the question is not whether we want to continue with the democratic uh, setup or to have a savior or a mesa to help us because this is a two different views of the uh, actually speaking it is confined to you yourself i think because that is not the expression of the people the people really want to have a democratic setup only not a major major period is no longer relevant now so the elected autocracy the what we call now what we are experiencing is a thing which is really a very tragic part in the history of our politics so, but the experts vajpay is concerned vajpay is also one of the persons who contributed for breeding all those things i would say so rss and vajpay are all actually the persons that who planted the seedlings of the present electoral authority which we to be now we exist uh, would you agree or disagree i don't know yes i i think that's very well said i think uh, vajpay certainly planted the seeds of autocracy and authoritarianism but modern india's first personality cult the first personality cult in politics was not a man was indira gandhi she was the first elected authoritarian you know and in fact the present regime i think mr narendra modi borrows a lot from indira gandhi i have often called him nar indira modi because he draws so much from indira gandhi you know he uh, the disrespect for institutions the dismissal uh, of the the disrespect for the parliamentary system for the press 
for the judiciary, uh, for the party. You know, do you need a party when the elected leader is talking directly to the people, is talking directly to uh, the voter? Why do you need the party? Today for every state election, municipal election, there is only one national leader whose face we see. You know, whether it's a Delhi municipal election, whether it's a Gujarat state assembly election, whether it's Himachal state assembly election, forget general elections. Every election is now a national election. In the same way as in the 1970s, Indira Gandhi was there in every state election, every municipal election of the Congress, every uh, every uh, every uh, 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 local election of the Congress, Indira Gandhi. So when you have only one face who is dominating every election, it's the same in every party. You know, today in, uh, in Bengal, I come from Bengal, I mean, you have the tremendous personality cult of Mamta Banerjee. She is winning the elections. So elections are won in her name, you know. So in that sense, I think that uh, this trend is entrenched in India. It began with Indira Gandhi. I think it's a part of the media-driven uh, sort of ecosystem in which we live. But I think that once this phase of personality-driven politics comes to an end, and I think it will come to an end because, um, you know, what happens is that Indian politics is cyclical. It's cyclical. It's cyclical. It goes through cycles. Uh, today we have a personality, tomorrow we won't have a personality, there'll be some other issue. So I think these go through cycles, but today we have personality-driven politics created in the beginning, I would say in the 1970s by Indira Gandhi. Yes, thank you. I think there are a number of questions we really need to hurry. Uh, yeah, please. Thank you so much. Now, in 1980, Pajpayee, when he was the president of BJP, he created the slogan of Gandhian Socialism. My query is, if anything, what has been Pajpayee's engagement with Gandhi? And my second quick query is, you know, Pajpayee fought to replace Modi after the Godra massacre. He talked about Rajadharma. So why couldn't he succeed? So these are very, very important questions and I don't know whether we have time to go into them but we will address them. You know, Gandhi and socialism was how Vajpayee wanted to create the BJP. Gandhi Vadi Samajwad. And I think his relationship with Gandhi was always one of uh, emulation. I mean, uh, Vajpayee in speech after speech rejected any kind of uh, link with Godse. Uh, with, the, with the Hindu nationalism's link with Godse and kept saying that Godse was a rogue, he had nothing to do with the Hindu movement, he was acting on his own. Now, the tragedy for Vajpayee is that Gandhian socialistic, socialism oriented BJP could not win elections. In 1980, the BJP was defeated in all assembly elections. In 1981, defeated in all assembly elections because that was the time that Indira Gandhi had come back to power. 1983, three big elections, Karnataka, uh, Andhra Pradesh, Delhi, BJP wiped out. Worst defeat of all, Jammu and Kashmir, BJP wiped out and Hindu Jammu voted for Congress, not for BJP. So by then the RSS said this Gandhian socialism is just not working for us, it's not getting us votes, we are not winning elections. Then finally the last straw, 1984. 1984 was the death of Gandhian socialism. BJP reduced to two seats. Vajpayee himself lost his seat. So that was the end of Gandhian socialism. So then the RSS decided, Choro abhi Gandhian socialism, vichardhara, vichardhara, vichardhara me jao. Because that is the only way we are going to win. We can't win. What is this Vajpayee saying? This middle of the road, Gandhi bhi hai, socialism bhi hai, this is there. You know, I, I, I'm secular, I'm a moderate. It's not getting us anywhere. And you know, interestingly, when Vajpayee was talking about Gandhi and socialism, 
Indira Gandhi was playing Hindu politics. She was uh, playing the politics of Hindu consolidation in uh, Jammu and Kashmir. When she said Farooq Abdullah is a separatist, don't vote for Farooq Abdullah. So, Vajpayee had bad luck with Gandhi and socialism. Uh, your second question on that he wanted to sack Narendra Modi after Godra. Yes, it's, I've detailed it in my book. He was determined to get uh, Mr. Narendra Modi to resign after Godra, but he was outsmarted in the party. And that's where, you know, Meena's point about moral frailty comes in. He did not dig his heels in because Advani said Ki we should not get rid of Modi because he's going to win us elections. So, and the party went against him. Pramod Mahajan, who was Vajpayee's great aide, he was, he was placed a lot of trust on Pramod Mahajan, did not want to get rid of Modi. And so he, he uh, you know, he, I've detailed the scene in my book. Uh, this was in Goa, uh, the national executive in Goa in 2002. And uh, just before the national executive, all of us were told, the media was told that Modi is going to resign, keep your cameras on, go into breaking news. Rajdeep Sardesai, who was a journalist uh, with NDTV at Goa, he, Rajesh Mishra told him that there will be some breaking news, Mr. Modi will resign, be ready to flash it. So they were all sorry, ready to Mom, flash Sorry this. for the interruption, our time's up. Oh, okay. So, sorry, okay. Yeah. Uh, but uh, you, I mean, it's all there in my book, so you'll be able So, Sagrika is available. You can talk yeah. to her outside. Thank you so much. It's been a scintillating crowd. Uh, so, I think in an age when uh, dictators are very beloved of people, I'm reminded of that very famous quote, three, two cheers for democracy because it doesn't deserve a third cheer. And that is where the relevance of people like Washpai comes in. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sagarika. Thank you so much.